Great. All right, testing, testing. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm Lucas Baker from Jump Crypto, and uh, I'm here today to speak to you about two things. The first is every researcher's favorite path pastime, which is redefining MEV. And the second is uh, an interesting theoretical result that uh, we have about the invariance of certain types of MEV. So without further ado, First, I'll be uh, covering the difference between ordering and signal MEV, which is a distinction that's been covered in a recent post by uh, Frontier Research. Second, I'll uh, go through the mechanics of the setup that uh, we have in order to prove some invariance results about MEV, or essentially uh, signal MEV. And finally, we will uh, go through the results themselves and their, uh, and their implications. So, at a high level, there are a couple of ways to think about MEV. The normal way is instantaneous value extractable from a transaction by reordering, inserting, or removing. In other words, it's what you can do by swapping things around, taking them in or out. And that is the perfect way to think of the internal frame of reference. In other words, if you're looking at PGAs or contention within a block, it's what you'd naturally arrive at in a you know, on-chain, ETH-denominated environment. However, it is not the only way. Uh, specifically, and uh, you know, Jump is a, is a trading firm, so as a traditional finance firm, our reference point typically has some aspect of the outside world, of reference prices. And uh, when you think about you know, cross-domain, non-atomic value, we've had a lot of uh, conversations where somebody says, cross-domain MEV is, is large, it's important. And uh, you know, how important? Uh, well, I don't know. It's, it's very difficult to measure. It's, uh, and I, I think that part of this discrepancy is because it hasn't been very well defined thus far. Uh, all, of, all of the things that people tend to focus on in MEV tend to be within the internal frame of reference. So the external frame of reference would be something that we'd want to consider when centralized exchanges or other chains or any other source of true or reference price is involved. So uh, up here are a few of the dashboards with which you're likely familiar. Uh, there's EigenFi, there's MevBoost.Pix, there's the Flashbots. So this is all internal MEV. Now, the uh, post that I alluded to by Frontier is uh, defining the difference between ordering and signal MEV. So ordering is what we're used to. It's the atomic arbitrage. It's sandwiching. It's liquidations, including, for example, Uniswap JIT liquidations. EV signal, uh, on the other hand, would involve some external frame of reference, some notion of truth. And that would be you know, what we'd get if we were, for example, performing CFI, DeFi arbitrage or if there were any notion of proprietary order flow. So why, uh, why belabor the definition? Well, it is uh, it's quite different in terms of the consequences of the MEV as well as the uh, actual type. So EV ordering, more of a relative frame of reference. It's about redistribution between participants. Signal MEV, you can think of as a pie that is uh, really there no matter who claims it, it will be claimed by someone in an efficient market. Eventually, all signal-based strategies or gaps converge. And so it's going to be there one way or another. Finally, MEV for this talk. So we'll mostly be speaking about uh, EV signal. The reason it's not just labeled EV signal is that uh, we're also going to be considering atomic arbitrage, but uh, essentially, the main point to absorb here is that we're looking at all transacting addresses rather than a subset of, let's say, informed flow versus uninformed flow. And as a result of this, it's uh, essentially non-extractive. Specifically, there's no notion of a victim transaction. There is just a discrepancy in price that is eventually closed. And uh, yes, finally, as, as covered, you know, it's uh, mostly arbitrage, just putting those gaps together. Okay, so with that, we can ask some interesting questions about block design. 
specifically the size of the signal pi. For example, if we change around the block time, does it affect the amount of EV signal that we have? What about the uh, transaction ordering mechanism? You know, if we have FIFO, if we have fair ordering, what, uh, what does that have, what impact does that have on the signal EV or the external frame of reference specifically? Now, a priori, it is unclear whether this is true or false, so it's easy to generate hypotheses under which it's true. For example, you, let's say that we have a price that moves around a certain reference. You, know, you, you might be able to arbit down, arbit up, and if you have more frequent block times, you might imagine that you'd get to do that several times before the price converges back to where it started. And our results are going to prove that no, neither the ordering mechanism nor the shorter block times increase the uh, EV signal. And here's a visual representation of what we're analyzing. So we're looking at, uh, as I described, the external price. If it goes up, then you can imagine the, uh, imagine for example that we were granted the ability to confirm a certain transaction or that uh, you know, the block ended earlier. In that case, we could simply take the Uniswap price, put it up to the external price and then put it down, put it up, put it down. So that, that would be the arbitrage that the uh, system would collectively be performing. The question is, you know, if this happens, if block times are more frequent, if we change the ordering mechanism, does it affect this? Of course, in this case, it does. But there are other possible trajectories of price, which is uh, what we'll be turning to now. OK, so uh, consider, if you will, Frictionless sphere DeFi, the uh, platonically perfect world where we have one AMM, one risky asset, one numeraire, uh, you know, a base asset in which everything is denoted. And uh, the risky asset, this can generalize to multiple risky assets, but we'll just consider one for the time being. Now price is a semi-martingale. Uh, you, can, you can think of it as a martingale for our purposes. Uh, there will be small technical distinctions based on the fees or not, but uh, basically we have a price that moves around semi-randomly. We'll model the liquidity pool as a state machine. So this is the states, the admissible actions, the, or, or the set of actions, the admissible actions, some transition, some payoff, and some initial state, just as you'd expect. OK, we have uh, three steps of setup to go through, and then we can present our results. Step one, liquidity pools. So uh, we can define a no arbitrage state as a situation where the pool is going to converge to some external price P. At that point, any divergence from that state will lose money. Uh, frictionless, there is a unique no arbitrage state for any given reference price. And this would describe most AMMs, most uh, Uniswap style AMMs without trading fees. Also, we have a notion of efficiency. So that's uh, where every state is no arbitrage for some price. Uh, these properties will come in later when we use them to distinguish between different types of MEV invariants. And uh, finally, we will consider pools with fees, but we will always consider them with reference to a, fiction or a frictionless no-fee version as the underlying pool. All right, step two, the blockchain market. So this is the consensus process, uh, as, as you'd think of it. There is an ordering mechanism. You know, some theoretical sequence of actions T, not necessarily admissible, like we can't necessarily do it. And then according to the probability distribution, some actual admissible permutation of these transactions will be selected. So in the end, we'll get a block. And that's our T prime. Uh, we assume for our purposes that it's deterministic block time. So this is the, the state of affairs in Ethereum. Um, Self-financing strategies. That's just a way of saying we can't source external liquidity, so anything that a strategy has has to be fueled by its prior positions. Uh, we have arbitrage strategies, which end up holding only the numeraire. And we have a simple arbitrage strategy that uh, is executing a single trade. So specifically, the simple arbitrage strategy is going to, you can think of it as wait until the end of the block and execute the single most profitable trade. Now we have uh, four more concepts to get through. Concurrent, so disjoint, uh, competing for all the same liquidity. Covering, that means if you sum the strategies together, we get all the trades. Complete, uh, if you sum the strategies together, they produce an arbitrage strategy. And competitive, 
So the block ends in a no arbitrage state, and all strategies participate sometimes. Uh, what does sometimes mean? Well, they all participate at least some non-zero number of times per strategy, and there are at least two that you know expected infinitely many times. OK, now, setup on the MEV and the PNL. We are going to define a PNL as a stochastic notion, a stochastic function of T. There's also a PNL star, and that is the uncontested PNL for a complete set of strategies. And remember, that's just, uh, you know, it adds up to all of the transactions. Now, we have three notions of MEV. And part of the reason why we've established all of these mechanics is so that we can give a complete formalization here in a rigorous way that can be tested and proved. So we have the pathwise competitive MEV. This is the best MEV that's achievable under competitive circumstances when you uh, have a condition of path independence. So that's uh, you know lowest upper bound of the sum of all the PNLs of the strategies. You also have the competitive MEV. So this uh, this will be useful as we introduce the notion of fees. We can no longer think about path independence. You can think that, for example, if you went up. You went down, you went back again. If you incur th fees three times, it's worse than incurring them once. So no longer path independent, but we still have a competitive MEV, which means that the, uh, the strategies are still going to try to arb off any opportunity when they can. And now we just have the best expected value. Finally, we have a notion of a non-competitive MEV, where we no longer require all of the strategies to be competitive. What this means in practice is that you can wait a little bit if you'd want to, for example, to perform an arbitrage and you don't have to worry about someone else sniping you. OK, finally, uh, our results in the frictionless case. So the pathwise competitive MEV is simply equal to the uncontested PNL of the simple arbitrage strategy. We also can prove that the competitive MEV, so that's uh, you know, in, the, in the fee case mostly, is equal to the expected PNL of the simple arbitrage strategy. And uh, finally, if the pool is path independent and price is fully a martingale, then uh, you know, we have no alpha about the price. Then we have that the MEV star, so the non-competitive MEV, is equal to the competitive MEV is equal to the expected PNL, uncontested PNL of the arbitrage strategy. This sums up to it doesn't matter how you slice it, the MEV opportunity from signal is the same either way. Okay, now let's add in some fees. Uh, this makes things a little bit harder because we can no longer guarantee path independence, but we can have reference to an underlying pool that is efficient and path independent, in which case we can say that the competitive MEV when P is a martingale is the expected value of the uncontested strategy, et cetera, as before. OK, but now when we introduce fees, as you might imagine, block time does play a role. So consider instead of S0, which is our simple arbitrage strategy, an ST that uh, doesn't submit at the end of every block. Instead, it just waits as long as it can until the end of the, the teeth block, and it submits one trade that captures all of the optimal arbitrage there. Then we have that the non-competitive MEV equals the uh, expected PNL of the ST strategy. And finally, results for block times. Uh, we have no fees. So if we have a B prime, remember blockchain market is basically just how we construct the block. So consider a B prime blockchain market that's just like B, but subdivided. Uh, in that case, we can say that the simple ARB strategy performs equally well for both competitive and non-competitive MEV. So in the, in the no fees case, it doesn't matter how you slice it. In the fees case, if we have, again, an efficient path independent underlying, P is a martingale, then the non-competitive MEV is constant because we can have a strategy that waits while all the others don't execute. But the, uh, the competitive MEV may decrease because if you try to pull that in a competitive context, then you're you're going to be outcompeted, or there's going to be an arb at the end of every block. So what have we gotten here? Well, first of all, I'd like you to come away with uh, signal MEV matters. So we ought to be able to think in both the internal and the external frame of reference. Ordering MEV is mostly about a redistribution. Signal MEV is really more of the uh, public good public goods fund, the good sort of MEV that people want. It's a revenue stream that is available to all agents in the transaction pipeline. 
uh, it is mostly design invariant. So, of course, fair ordering uh, or any notion thereof affects how value is distributed between participants, which is again what we've been, uh, you know, what most work has been concerned with. But in terms of the signal value, it's independent of the block time without fees. It gets actually smaller uh, as the block time decreases with fees, and the ordering mechanism doesn't matter at all. Finally, we should be thinking cross-domain. Uh, you know, CFI DeFi is only one instance of cross-domain, but everybody has had the notion for a long time that MEV outside of the bare context of uh, you know, in-protocol Ethereum matters. No one has really even made an effort to quantify it as far as we're aware. So this is uh, a still extremely early and overall low visibility area where we think that uh, some of the you know, theoretical research from traditional finance and some of the general knowledge and expertise can be leveraged to have a fuller knowledge of the expanded system. And that's all I got, thank you. a convergence point and there's only a single one and the thing converges at all. So I was wondering whether those assumptions are realistic. As you know, a dynamic system like uh, the blockchain uh, is very chaotic and just like any other machine learning real world problem, it, it doesn't really converge to a single point and in a lot of cases it doesn't even converge. So how does that affect your result? And when special spikes happen, like when there's an event, a popular board ape uh, thing just got released and there's a spike. Uh, so the environment changes, it's no longer stationary. And, and does the result still hold when the environment changes and at what rate? Uh, thank you for that. Let's see, uh, the question was about the changing of uh, environment and whether that affects our results. Uh, I think the general flexibility of our results is uh, the, the most important condition is the price being under a uh, you know, constant conditions, it's a martingale, so that uh, if, the, if the regime changes or you know, we, have, uh, we have conditions that don't fit our frictionless sphere DeFi, that, uh, that may have a limited impact on the results, but as long as the price uh, movement is consistent, I think most of it holds. And uh, you, can, you can look into the details when we uh, publish on Archive shortly. All right, thank you very much.